so now we're again sort of as is, is, is an overview of where we're going in the course. Now we're going down into the stack, going from sort of the higher level parts of concurrency control and index management and things like that. Now we're actually going to the lower sort of levels of the storage manager. So this is actually how the database system is actually going to store data in memory. So for today's lecture, we're going to first start, start off talking about how we represent the different data types, the values of different data types in memory, and then we'll talk about how we do different layouts of, of or how we're going to lay out our, our data uh, in, our, in, our, in, in memory. And then we'll finish off talking about the different types of storage models that you can have. Um, so just one high level comment I'll say is that a lot of the things that I'll be talking about here today are not specific to in-memory databases. I'll be describing them in the context of an in-memory database, but they're certainly still applicable to, uh, to you know, disk-based systems as well. Okay? So, uh, we saw this diagram at the beginning of the semester when I showed you how the an in-memory database was going to lay out the actual data. Right? We said we were going to have some kind of index, whether it's a skip list, a BW tree, a B plus tree, it doesn't matter. And the value portion of the key value pair in the index would be a memory address that was going to point to some location of where the tuple is that this thing is pointing to. Right? And you see this in your skip list invitation, right? the value type of your skip list is an item pointer. The item pointer is essentially this thing here. And what the item pointer actually is, is going to be a um, composite key comprised of a unique block ID that tells you which one of these blocks you want to go to, and then an offset within that block. Because what you would do is you use the block ID to figure out what the starting address is for this block of memory, and then you use the offset to jump to where, the, where that is. And, and th we can do this because all the, the tuples here are going to have fixed length attributes. Right, so we know exactly how to jump down to whatever position it is that we need to get to. And then for things that are variable length, we'll have a pointer that points to some block of memory in a, a variable length pool. Um, in our current implementation in, in Peloton, the, the ephemeral pool is just a wrap around GE malloc. Um, right, this is why you're not allowed to write malloc and free in your code. Right? We do all that for you in, in that pool. Uh, when we start talking about doing sort of analytical queries on, on NUMA architectures, uh, it does become actually important to actually know where your, where your memory is, and maybe JE malloc is not exactly what you want to use. Maybe you want to manage me a memory a little bit more on your own. So you can think of, it a, of an in-memory database as essentially just a bunch of large blocks of uh, arrays of memory, or arrays of bytes. Right? We're just going to malloc these those large blocks, and the database system is going to use the schema that was defined for the table to understand how to interpret those, 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 the bytes within those arrays to be whatever it is the type that, that it is that we're looking at. Right? And what's going to happen is for every single tuple in our block, we'll have a little bit of extra space in front of it as a prefix, as a header, to tell us whatever extra additional information we need to know about the tuple. We saw this when we talked about MVCC, when we talked about how uh, these protocols would store the versioning information or the, the next or previous pointer to the, to the next version in the header. Right? We'll have that in front of, of, of the tuple, and then everything came, comes after the header is, that, is the actual data. So because we're always going to store tuples uh, in the, the fixed length data blocks, again, it's going to make it really easy for us to be able to jump to whatever tuple that we need. Because right, we know exactly how the, the, what the size is going to be for each tuple. And if we know we want the fifth tuple, we know how to take whatever the, current, the, the, the starting memory address for the block and then multiply it by the length of the tuple plus, plus a delta for the, for the header to jump to the location that, that we're looking for. And this is essentially the, kind of the same thing that uh, a disk-based database system is doing. A disk-based database system is sort of managing pages, but it's moving them on and out, in and out of disk. In our case here, we're just managing in-memory blocks. So the way you're actually going to represent the low-level data types uh, will obviously depend on what, what the type is. So for the basic integers, like you know, the integer, big int, small int, tiny int, medium int, right, the 16, 32, or 64-bit integers, for these, we're just going to use the sort of the native C or C++ representation of, of these numbers. Because this is sort of the native representation of the numbers in the low-level architecture. So we don't have to do anything special for these, right? We just declare an, you know, a 32-bit integer in C or C++, and that ends up being what gets stored in memory, and that's how we're going to represent those, those values, right? 
So that, that's pretty straightforward. When it comes time to doing sort of floating point numbers or decimals, that's when things get a bit tricky. As some of you saw when you implemented the extract function in project number one, some of you were hitting weird rounding errors, right? And the, so there's a distinction between whether you want to have the float or the real type, which are sort of, again, you would use the native C or C++ uh, da uh, data representation for these values, or whether you want to use the numeric or decimal type, which would allow for uh, fixed point decimals or arbitrary precision decimals to avoid the rounding errors that you, were, you guys were hitting. So I'll, I'll spend more time talking about this, but this will explain why some of you were hitting the, the weird rounding errors when you started doing the math to, to compute the extract function. Uh, and as we said before, for very length values, so var char, var binary, text, blob, uh, anything where it could be a variable length, if the value is less than 64 bits, then we can store it directly in line in our fixed length uh, uh, block of data. If it's larger than that, then we'll have a pointer uh, to the location of the variable length pool. And at that pointer, uh, th th that, that location, there'll be another header that says, what's the length of this, this sort of blob? And then followed by all, all the data bytes. And if, you're, if your blob is really big, and exceeds the size of a sort of a slot in the variable length pool, you can also have the sort of a pointer to the next, next blob, so you can sort of chain these things together. Um, typically, you don't want to store really, really large items in a database. You don't want to store like, you know, a, a 10 gigabyte file, um, but you could if you wanted to. And the way you would do that is just have these pointers. For timestamps, dates, and times, uh, this really depends on the implementation of, of the actual database system. Different systems do different things. So uh, in the case of like in Peloton, we follow what we did in HStore and VoltDB, where we're always going to store every, every sort of the, these types of attributes as a 64-bit integer, as either the milliseconds or microseconds since the, the Unix epoch. Um, in other systems, if you say you want a time field versus the date field, then it can use a lower number because you don't have to store additional information about things you don't care about. So for example, if you want a date field, you don't care about time, then you can just store that as a 32-bit a number. Uh, and I don't really talk about too much about this. Things get kind of weird uh, when you bring in time zones, which is part of the reason why we didn't ask you to do time zones from the extract function. Um, and in that case, if you may, may need to keep a track of additional information to say that this timestamp is for this time zone. Um, that's, that's a whole other ball of wax, which, which gets into like ISO standards that I don't want to talk about. All right, so we spend more time talking about the floats and the reals and the, and the, and the numerics and decimals. So the float and reals, or doubles, are inexact variable precision floating point numbers that, again, are using the native, when I get native in quotes, C or C++ data types. And these essentially map down to the native types of the underlying architecture on the CPU. And so the way this is, the, the, these CPUs store this is follows what's called the IEEE 754 standard. So this is a standard that came out um, uh, a couple of decades ago that would describe exactly how floating point numbers or variable precision numbers should be represented in hardware and therefore this is what the C and C++ guys adopt. Um, these are going to be much, much faster than the arbitrary precision numbers which we'll see in a second. But the downside is that as you saw in the extract function, sometimes you get weird rounding cases, right? Or rounding errors that, that are unexpected. So this standard essentially specifies exactly how the data is stored in, in terms of number of bits. Right, where the Matisse is, where the actual underlying value is. Uh, and it tells you what the hardware should do when you have rounding errors, when you have real numbers and things like that. Right, because it's kind of, you know, there's, if you think about it, you can't represent certain numbers like 1 divided by 3 in an, in an exact form. Right, so they have to specify what do you do in, in examples like that. So everyone should have taken like an intro uh, systems course Right? So this, this should not be like groundbreaking news to anyone here. Right? But this is a really simple example you can see in, in, a, in, a, in a simple C code. You can, see, you can see what I mean why this is problematic. So let's say we de declare two floats, x and y, 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. And if we add x and y together, we would expect the answer to be 0 0.3. Right? And likewise, if we just take 0 0.3 and we just print that out, we expect the number just to be 0 0.3. Uh, but when you actually run this code here, because I have this qualifier in, in my printf statement to say, show me all you know, 20 places out for the full, full digit, you get this result here. Right? So x plus y equals 0 0.3, and then a whole bunch of stuff down here. 
uh, and 0 0.3 directly equals 2999 all the way over. Right? This is because the IEEE standard specifies that you can't store these numbers exactly. So this is why some of you were getting rounding errors, but then you did print F to actually see the output, you would only it would look like it would exactly match. But when you actually do an equality comparison between these two numbers, it would always come up different. This is because at the very you know, low end of, of the value, there's a bunch of these uh, extra decimal points. Right, so if I got rid of the, uh, you know, the, the dot, dot two zero when I printed this, it would be, they would both be equivalent. It would be 0 0.33, or 0 0.3000, 0 0.3000. 0 .3000. They would look exactly the same when they printed up the string, but when you do the comparison, they would be different. Right, because this is because, again, for variable precision numbers, they cannot store decimals exactly. Right, so this is bad, right? If, you're start, if you need to store something that, where you don't want to have rounding errors, you can't use these. So this is where the fixed precision numbers c come along, right? These are sometimes called arbitrary precision numbers or fixed point decimals. And the basic idea is that we're going to store uh, decimal values in the exact form uh, inside of the database, and we're going to have to do a bunch of special extra, you know, maintain some extra metadata to keep track of all of the sort of precision information about the decimal, right? To do this, you would do the numeric and, and decimal data types. Sometimes the, you read the database systems, you read the manuals, they'll say that these things are just synonyms, they're equivalent to each other. Uh, when I was poking on Postgres last night, they, they, are, they are actually different. They, they, the decimal has less metadata than the numeric one. But what's going to happen is rather than storing as a floating point number, what we're going to do is we're going to store it as a sort of like a, like a var chart, like the actual digits as they were given to the database system in their exact form. All right, so sort of like storing, storing a string without really being a string. So this is actually a snippet of the code inside of Postgres of how they represent the numeric data types. So again, Postgres was written in C from the 1990s, so they don't have classes, they have structs, but it's essentially the same thing. So this is a struct for how you represent a single uh, numeric value inside of Postgres. And as you can see, there's a bunch of additional metadata that they're keeping track of for just a single value. Right, so for, first of all, they have to need to know the number of digits uh, you know, that, 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 that was provided to it. Then you have the weight for how to, um, if you need to have a new base value for the, the, the number to store it at, in a smaller form. Then you have the scale factor to how to make, to convert it from a decimal to an integer. Then you have the sign information to tell you whether the number is, is positive or negative or it's, it's a not a number. And then you have the actual uh, bytes for storing the, the digits. Right, so this they have, say, numeric digits, and it's just an array. And this numeric digit is just a, uh, an alias where they have a type def above where they're storing uh, unsigned chars, essentially chars. So for every single digit in my number, they're storing it as, as, as 8 bits or as 1 byte. Right, whereas before I could take a single number and store it as, uh, uh, I could store it as, as you know, a single 64-bit value, I had, now I have to store extra bits or extra, you know, for every single digit, right? So this is how Postgres and all, and all the data systems that support numeric data types are going to avoid the rounding errors that come up with, you know, with generate in, in inexact answers, right? But now the problem is this is slow, right? So when you actually look at the Postgres code, this is, this is just a snippet of their uh, addition function. So this is, allows you to take numeric plus numeric and produce a numeric. And I'm not going to read all the code, but you just want to see that there's all this like conditional statements to say like if one's positive and one's negative, then you have to convert it a certain way. Uh, if one's not a number and the other one is a number, then do something different, right? So this is going to be way, way slower than doing just the native IEEE 754 data types because in that case, the harbor supports it. You just put it down into you know, a floating point register and do your addition, right? Where in this case here, we're executing multiple instructions just to do this computation. Um, to give you an idea of how much slower this is, I have a quick demo with Postgres. Um, so what I did here is I, I created a, uh, a simple table in Postgres with, um, with 10 million records that's going to have... Um, uh, oh, don't do that. Sorry. With two columns. Right? There'll be an A and B column. And both of them are going to be just regular integers. Or sorry, it'll be floating point numbers. So for each one, I, have, I, loaded one, I loaded the data set once into a table that has all decimal types, so the arbitrary precision ones, and I've loaded another one that would use the real type, 
right? With, which is using the native, the native format. So this one has 10 million, and then this one has 10 million as well. Right? So these are the exact same data stored differently in, in, in Postgres. Let me slide it over, sorry. Okay. So, so what we'll do is we'll compute an aggregate to compute the sum of, of A and B together. And we'll do it once with, um, with the, with the as, as, a, as a real, right, using the IEEE standard, right, and it'll produce some answer. And then we'll do the same thing now with decimals. And it produces a different answer. And obviously much slower, right? And now you see here, like, it, this is some scientific notation. It, it rounded off a lot of stuff, where this is, looks like an, an exact number. And you might have saw that the, doing it on the, the reals was much faster, which we can see when we do explain analyze, right? Now we run this query, and it says it took uh, 1.7 seconds. I do the same query now on decimals, using explain analyze, and it's going to tell me it's going to do it in almost 4 seconds, 3.9 seconds. And just to show you that this is not cached in any way, I can execute this multiple times and see that it's always going to be roughly uh, produce the same answer, right? There's no caching effect going on here, right? So this is showing you that in the, in the decimal case, it has to go through all that code that I showed before to do that addition where they're checking to make sure that you don't have any rounding errors, you're doing the, the addition correctly. Whereas in the, uh, in, the, in the real case, it's just doing the hardware to go directly at the two things. So now, again, I showed you here that we had two different answers, right? Um, so we can actually execute some Python code that will just rip through the CSV file. Um, mm. That sucks. Oh, sorry, I know why, sorry. So we'll read in the CSV file, have a total, and then it's going to go through it and calculate the total by casting two objects as floats. So in this case here, right, it produces the answer 9950687, 4.7, and we go back, and that's roughly the same answer that Postgres got when we did it as decimals. Right? Because this is showing you that Python is doing a little extra work too to make sure it doesn't have the rounding errors by looking at the native types. Right? So again, the main takeaway here is that we can have, uh, we have floating point numbers that would use the, the IEEE 754 standard, and that'll be faster, but it has rounding errors. Or we can use numeric and decimals where we're doing extra work to make sure we don't have rounding errors, but it's going to be slower. All right, so you would, use the, you would use these numeric types anytime you're dealing with money, right, because you don't want to lose money. And anytime you're dealing with, with, with any kind of scientific uh, data, where you want to make sure you have exact answers. Because right? one of the big problems with, with using the, the native types is if I load my database on one machine with one kind of CPU and I compute the answer, and then I run that same uh, query on another machine with the same data, it may come out with a di slightly different answer. Right? And that's obviously bad. Um, so again, anytime you're doing something you don't want to have rounding errors, you, you would use a numeric one. So we saw another way to do this sort of uh, uh, fixed point decimals in the paper you guys read last class. We saw how to do sort of decimal encoding in the SQL Server columnar indexes. And so I skipped over exactly the, the, the protocol to do this, but I want to show it now just again as another example of how you can do this kind of conversion uh, to do extra work, but again, get exact results. So let's say we have a list of values, uh, 0 0.5, 10.77, 10 1.33. So the first thing we're going to do to convert these uh, decimals into to, to fixed point numbers is that we want to produce an exponent that we can multiply these values by 10 to that raised to that exponent to convert them all from, from decimals to integers. So in this case, it's three, because we need to shift all these numbers over by three decimal points. So 10 to the three would do that. So you, you would end up like this, an answer like this. So now what we're going to do is now we we're going to pick the lowest value as the base for these converted numbers in, in the initial encoding. In this case here, the lowest value is 500. So now what we're going to then do is go back and subtract 500 from all these values to put them into an even smaller form. And the idea here is, again, this is sort of, a, we're, doing comp we're doing encoding to go from a, from, a, from a floating point number to a fixed point number. And then we're also doing this additional compression so that if we have really large numbers, instead of storing them as maybe full 32 or 64-bit integers, maybe we can store it as, as, a, as a lower data type. And then to do any kind of calculation to, you know, when we add two of these numbers together, 
we can just do this natively and then the reverse, do the, the reverse steps to put it back into its correct form. All right? So currently in Peloton, we use the IEEE standard. We just use the native uh, floating points in, in for, our, for our decimals. Uh, but I think this would be a pretty good project number three for, for possibly for a group to actually supporting, supporting these, uh, these arbitrary precision numbers and looking at ways to actually speed them up using like query compilation and LLVM. But we can, we can talk about that later. Okay, so now that we know how to lay out individual values, let's talk about how you actually lay out a, a, a series of values for a tuple together in memory. So as I said, we can think of just the, the data space for a memory database is just a giant array of bytes, right? A char array. And so we said before that we're always going to have our header at the beginning. But then what's going to happen is for all the diff different uh, data types we have in our table specification, we're going to lay them out contiguously one after another in this, in this array. So in this case here, the first thing we would have is a, an ID field. And that's a 32-bit integer. So the next 32 bits would be stored here for that, the ID. And then after that, we'd have a 64-bit uh, value type. And then we'd have the next 64 bits for there. So again, the way this works inside of our system, when we actually want to say, I want to go read the ID field for a particular tuple, we know how to jump. We know how to find the tuple that we're looking for and then jump to the header. And we know the size of our header typically four bytes or something around, that, around, around, around there. And then we can do, jump to that offset to, to where the starting point is for this value here. So now to actually read this, we want to use uh, the reinterpret cast function in C++. So then I know what re reinterpret cast does. Yes? Exactly, so what he said is you keep the binary representation, but you change the type. Absolutely. So, we have some address here, that would be a char star, right? It's pointing someplace in loca location of memory. But then we want to start doing integer operations on it, right? So we need to cast it. So reinterpret cast essentially says, take whatever was at this address and, and you know, whatever type it was before, now treat it as this type. So in this case here, it's, it's now a 32-bit integer pointer. So then now all the other part in the code, we can then operate directly on, on that data as if it was a 32-bit integer. Right, so this it doesn't actually do anything. Like this, this doesn't actually in invoke new instructions. Right? This is a compiler directive so that when, when, you, when it compiles all your code, since C++ is strongly typed, it makes sure that you know, whatever's on the other side of this that starts accessing it needs to be, uh, you know, would, should be expecting a 32-bit integer. Right? You could do this in C by just sort of hand casting everything. Uh, but the, again, it's, it's dangerous because there's, there's nothing preventing us from treating this, this, this address here as a 64-bit integer and just start writing whatever you want to it. Right? This is why we do a lot of testing and do, uh, be very careful when we do coding inside a database system because there's nothing going to prevent us from just trashing this, this, this storage location. Right? So we use reinterpret cast and other things to make sure that, that the code is doing the thing we expect it to be doing. Right? So you'll see this a lot and we look at, I ever look at the type system in our database system you'll see a bunch of reinterpret casts to take sort of arbitrary pointers into memory and then convert them to whatever type we expect them to be. So now we want to talk a little bit about now how we represent nulls uh, in, in our database. And again, I said, as, as I said before, uh, there's nothing specific about what I'm going to describe here that is only pertains to in-memory databases. These, these are some of the same techniques that people use for uh, disk-based databases as well. So, there's essentially three ways to store to, to represent nulls, as far as I as far as I know. Um, the first is to designate a sort of special value in the domain of a value type to represent null for that type. So, for example, uh, say you want to represent uh, for 32-bit integers, you would use the lowest value you can store in a 32-bit integer to represent null. So, in this case here, in 32 min, right? And this is specified in like the uh, limits.h. So what would happen is if anybody tried to then insert a value with int32 min, uh, we would treat that as a null, right? Unless, oh, wait, 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 let me rephrase that. If someone, anytime we store, you need to store a null, we do always just store it in 32 min. But in the upper levels of the system, if someone tries to come and insert a value with this value here, we would throw an out of bounds exception to say we can't store this because we can, we can't, we're not gonna let the user manually insert this for us. 
right? So basically, the number of unique values you can have for a 32 bit integer is now subtracted by 1 because we're going to use a special value uh, for that. So this is, this is what we actually use in Peloton because this is what we originally used in HDOR and, and VoltDB. And what I like about this approach is it doesn't require any extra memory. Right? Yes, you have to check in the upper level parts of the system to make sure you don't, people don't try to insert this. Because right? it would be bad if someone tried to insert 32 min, we let them do it, but then we would represent it as null when they actually thought they stored it. Right? So that's why you have to throw an out-of-bounds exception. So again, there's, this doesn't require any extra storage overhead, which is why I, I like it. The other approach is actually probably more common is to maintain a bitmap in the tuple header that keeps track of which attributes in that tuple are null. So this is the approach that's used in you know, Postgres, MySQL, uh, times 10, SQL Server. So this is what pretty much everyone does. And so the downside of this obviously is that if you have a really wide tuple with a lot of attributes, then you can have a really wide bitmap. Right? So if you have, you know, this is why you see sort of limits on the size or the, or the, the width or the number of columns you can have in tables. Like I think Oracle is like a thousand. I think MySQL, or not MySQL, Postgres and SQL Server can support like 2 to the 16. Because right? again, if you think about it, you would, you'd have this huge array that you'd have to keep track of for every single uh, attribute in a tuple and that would be expensive. The last approach is to, uh, instead of maintaining a single data structure for the entire tuple, you maintain a single flag per attribute. So what happened is you would, for every single attribute in your, your byte array for the tuple, you would prefix it or add a little extra space to keep, keep a little flag to say whether this value is null or not. Right? So you only really need a single bit, right? Because it's either true or false. But the problem is because we need to care about word alignment, we actually have to store a lot more data than just a single bit. So if you actually look at the, uh, the manual for MemSQL, because MemSQL, is, as far as I know, is the only system that actually does this, you see uh, when you look, at, look up integer nut types, uh, they keep track of a bunch of information with the sizes and memory uh, and what the min and max values can have. But for these two columns here, you have the size when the value could be null and then the size when the value isn't null. And so what you see is in the case of, like, take a 32-bit integer, when it, when it can never be null, it's just four, four bytes. Right, 32 bits. But when it could be null, they have to have a little flag in, in the front of it that says, you know, true or false, whether it's null or not. And in that case, they have to store another four bits. So even though it's just a 32-bit integer, you have to store 64 bits because it may, it may be null. Right? And basically, for all the different data types, they are they're doubled in size. With big int, you're going from eight bytes to to 12 bytes. You can do this because you're because you need to keep keep track of word alignment. Now, when I say word alignment, does everybody know what I'm talking about or no? Okay, some people are saying no. Okay, good. So, uh, I'll, I'll describe what word alignment is now uh, and why we care about it in memory database. But I want to caveat with what I'm about to say is that what I'm about to say is actually not the, the way CPUs actually do it. So, the word and describe word alignment in the context of 64 bit words, but in reality, in real CPUs, you care about cache line words or 64 bytes. So I'm just showing you how to do this, what, it means, what word alignment means in 64 bits. Uh, but in, again, when you go out in the real world, do this on a real system, you care about 64 bytes. It's just easier to see it at, at a smaller scale. So the thing, about, so the thing with word alignment is that we, the idea is that we want to make sure that we, we don't have the CPU do extra work in order for us to read data. So let's say we have our table here, all right, and now we have, um, we have four attributes we need to store in, our, in a byte array. But in our byte array, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it up into 64-bit words or 64-bit chunks. And as you see, as I start adding values in, you'll see that we're going to start crossing these boundaries, which is problematic. So for this, ignore the header, right? Assume that it's already there. It doesn't, it doesn't change this. So first we start off with our ID. It's cut off, but this is 32 bits. So we would store the ID field in the, in the first half of this first word. Then we store the, the timestamp, and let's say it's a 64-bit timestamp. Uh, Sorry, that, and that would be stored here. It would cover the latter half of the first word and then the second half of, or the first half of the, of the, the second word. Then we have our uh, color field, and this is a, a fixed length char, so that's always going to be um, uh, uh, 16 bits. And then we have our zip code, which would be 32 bits, which is now again going to span the, the, the word boundary here. So now if I want to do a lookup on, on the date field, right? What would happen in this case? 
Right? How, how does the hardware actually work? When I say I want to read a word, right, and I tell it you know, what address I want, because everything's byte addressable, what would happen in this case here? Two he says two fetches, right? Actually, it depends, but on x86, yes, it's two fetches, right? So there's a couple of different things that could happen. So say we want to read a 64-bit value, and it's not word aligned. There's three things that could occur. The first is that the, the, the hardware is going to be nice for us, and it's going to recognize that you're trying to read stuff that spans the, the word boundary, and it's going to do the first fetch, put, it, put the upper half of the, the bits you need into a register, then do a second fetch, get the other half you need, and then combine them together and provide it to you in a single register with them, with them together. Right? So essentially for a single fetch, you now have to, a single load operation, you have to do sort of two loads into, into memory to bring things into the CPU caches. The other approach is that it's simply it's undefined behavior, right? The, it's left to the CPU to decide whatever it is that, that it wants to do. It could you know, read the first word and give that to you without actually aligning it correctly. It could read the second one, start dropping things, right? You just don't know. And then the last approach is to throw back an exception to say, you're trying to do unaligned, unaligned memory access. Uh, I can't let you do this. This is going to be slow. And, it, and, it, and your operation fails. So the first approach is what x86 or x64 will do. Uh, this last approach is what ARM does, as far as, it, as, far as I know from last year. Um, and then as far as I know, I don't think anybody still does this. This was like what people did maybe in, like in the 80s and 90s. Right? So, this is actually problematic, right? Assuming we're going to run it on x86 hardware, then again, anytime we need to do a read, it's going to do twice the work to do that one read. So with, when we have word-aligned tuples, the basic idea is that we would recognize as we start writing out the attributes for our tuple into memory, if the, if the next word, the next sort of attribute cannot, be, cannot fit within the remaining space we have for our word that we're looking at, then we'll just add a little extra padding so that the, the, the next attribute starts at the, the next word alignment. So in this case here, the ID is a 32-bit integer, so we'd have 32 bits to pad it out so that the C date starts at the, at exactly at the word alignment. So now when I want to do the read on C date, right, I just jump to this cache line and, and get everything I need. Right, is, is this clear what's going on? So now I said before, right, this is not, you know, a 64-bit word is not exactly what real hardware does. Uh, it, in actuality, what would happen is you would you care about whether your your tuple could span uh, you know, cache line boundaries. So if you, if you have you know 64-bit words, 64-bit um, cache lines, if your one tuple was like 50 50 bytes, and then the next tuple would span that boundary, you would have the padding at the end of the tuple so that the next tuple starts uh, after that, right? And the padding is always going to be the same size because you have these fixed length tuples. Right, it's another advantage of these fixed length tuples. So I know that like, when I want to jump from tuple 1 to tuple 2, I have to account for this padding that I have to get to the, the correct location. So this is the approach that most in-memory databases systems actually do. Uh, we don't do this yet. Uh, it's on our to-do list. But any, any in-memory in database will, will do this for you. Because right? the performance benefit you get from it is, is actually quite significant. Yes? So uh, in addition to padding, his statement is, uh, in addition to carrying out padding, you want to make sure that your, your memory starts, uh, uh, that the physical address where the tuple starts, I guess it's really the block, starts at the word alignment. Yes, and I, the hardware does that when you do malloc. Yes? Do any databases rearrange your uh, data types in order to reduce your word uh, so her, statement, her question is, uh, do any database systems actually rearrange your data types to, uh, at the physical layer to reduce this, this extra padding? So an example could be, I can recognize that um, the, the, the color field here could be packed in here. It wouldn't be directly in order, uh, but you know, I would use less space. I don't know if anybody actually does this. Um, there's no reason you couldn't, right? This is the nice thing about SQL is you have the, or the relational models. You, there's an abstraction layer between the logical layout and the physical layout. So there's no reason I couldn't do that. Um, I don't think they'll do this, though, for, uh, for OLTP systems because the overhead of maybe marsh, uh, transforming the lookup might be too expensive for transactions. We're not going to have to actually do this when we do column stores, which we'll see in a second. Um, yeah, I don't know the answer. It seems like it would be actually kind of easy to do. 
So yeah, we should we should we should look into that. It's a good question. Yes. What's the point of the last term? the last one is the empty? Is it necessary? Oh, uh, what, like what's the point of this padding here? Uh, the, the, the next three. This? Yeah, yeah. Less empty space. That's where the next tuple will go. Yeah. Is it necessary? Or is what do you mean necessary? Like have empty. This is where the next. So there's another tuple which starts here. Oh, I see. Yeah. Back. But you said that uh, you want to keep cache line alignment so that. Uh, so that the next two goals, for example, won't spend two cache lines. Yes. Uh, so would it be beneficial if you keep that 60, last 64 bits? Yeah, so, so, so his statement is, I said before that we care, about, we care about whether our tuples span cache lines. So would it make sense to have the next tuple start here? Yeah, so again, in this example, I'm doing 64-bit words. Sorry, 64, yeah, 64-bit 64 words. So I'm assuming that like, this is the cache line which starts here. In a, in a in a real system with 64 byte cache lines, then yes. If this is not 64 bytes, then I, it, I would maybe want to start it later on. Right? And it's just additional padding. All right, cool. All right, so, uh, all right, so now we know how to actually store things in memory. We know how to take the data types, we know how to put it into, into memory, and you know, read and write to them, and then now we know how to lay out a tuple in memory so now we'll go a little bit higher and say, well, how do we actually organize the multiple tuples for a table? And so the, the three storage models that I'm going to talk about are the, the NSM or the NARY storage model, decomposition storage model, and we'll finish off talking about the hybrid model that we actually use in our database management system. So if you took an intro, I mean, when you took the intro database class, we made this huge assumption for almost the entire semester that everything was going to be in, in a, the NARY model without actually telling you about the, what it would actually meant, right? And because this is usually how people, you know, it's easier to understand databases if you sort of, you know, think about them being Excel spreadsheets where you have rows and you sort of, the, the, the values go across. Um, so in the NARY model, the basic idea is that you're always going to store all the attributes for a single tuple contiguously in memory. And this is, this is what you want to do for OLTP workloads because these workloads are doing, these types of queries, the type of queries in these workloads are doing lookups to go grab single tuples at a time and they usually need all the attributes, right? You think of like, I, I want to go log into my Amazon account, there's some, you know, account table or user table and it wants to go fetch all the attributes for, my, for, for that user and then use that to generate the web page, right? So this is why storing things in a sort of row-oriented manner it's good for LHP workloads because it's really easy to do lookup to get everything. It's also really easy to do inserts because now I just take the tuple that was provided me from the application and I just do a, a straight you know, write out to, to, to memory um, without having to break it up and do multiple writes. Yes, you may have to do extra padding, uh, but it's not like you have to write to this location, this location, and that location, right? It's sort of single, single swipe. The other aspect of this is that they're going to use the tuple at a time uh, model that we've been talking about before. Because again, this makes sen more sense in a in a OTP environment where you want to go grab single single tuples, right? So this is that again that volcano approach that we talked about at the beginning of the semester. So there's two ways to actually store uh, NSM data. So the first is to use heap organized tables, and this is what I sort of showed at the beginning, where we're going to have our tuples be collected together into these blocks called a heap, and We'll just have all our item pointers, our memory addresses, point to, to the block location and then offset within them. Um, so now in this case here with the heap, it doesn't, the, the heap is not going to define any order for our tuples. So this is, we can store, you know, insert and delete and update things in any way that we, that we want. Now contrast this with the index organized tables uh, where the, tuple, the, the actual data for the tuples themselves is going to be stored in the leaf nodes of the, of the index. So this is what MySQL actually does. So in MySQL and InnoDB, they have a B plus tree, and then actual leaf nodes is actually where you find the, the real tuples. So this is not quite the same as a clustered index, um, but it, it, it's, it's sort of similar. And so um, with clustered indexes, uh, you can use them for either the heap or index storage models. If you use the index or organized storage, it essentially just becomes the clustered, clustering index, right? Um, so again, in MySQL, you always get this. And the way they do it is that any, whatever you declare as the primary key for the table, that ends up being the clustering index for that table. So again, in MySQL, if you don't have a primary key, if you, don't, you, know, if you go call create table without one, it'll make a hidden one for you called the record ID, and it'll use that as the clustering, clustering index. 
Right, you can't see this from the application, but internally this is what it's doing. And sort of think of this as the same thing as like the logical pointers that we talked about uh, before when we were talking about secondary indexes for MVCC. Right, some sort of logical identifier that allows you to identify the single tuple that doesn't change uh, no matter how often you update the tuple. So not all database systems can use clustering indexes. Uh, in the case of Postgres, because Postgres uses the append storage method in MVCC, uh, any single time you modify a tuple, it ends up getting, a new version gets appended to the end of it. So it would be very difficult to have a clustering index for this and maintain the sort order from across the entire heap or table because every single time you updated something, you would have to reshuffle everything. Um, the, my, uh, Postgres does have a cluster function where you can f sort of force it to sort your uh, table as if you had a clustering index, but it's not a permanent thing. It's sort of like a one-shot uh, invocation or operation, and then as you start updating the, the table, things get all uh, out, of sort, out of order anyway. So, in the case of things like Oracle, my, or in the case of like Oracle, uh, they expose to you as the DBA whether you want your table to be uh, sort of index organized or heap organized. Right? And then depending on what you choose, the, the, the optimizer knows what kind of optimizations it can apply when it does query planning based on how it knows the, da the data is laid out. Right, this shouldn't be any, anything new. This is sort of the standard stuff that we covered in the intro class. So now, so with the NRA storage model, the advantages of using this, regardless of whether you're using a, uh, the index oriented storage or the, the, the heap storage, is that you can be able to support fast inserts, up to updates, and deletes because you only have to modify the data at a single, single memory address. Right? And typically, if your data, your tuple is less than a cache line, then you, you can go do a single fetch from memory to bring it into your CPU caches and go operate directly on it. So this is really good for queries that need the entire, entire tuple. Now the bad side, bad, uh, the, the, the downside of using uh, the NSM is that it's really bad for doing OLAP queries to have to scan large portions of the entire table and only need to look at a subset of the attributes. Because right? what would happen is as you sort of scan through the table, uh, Say you only need one column out of ten, you're bringing all the other nine columns into your, to your CPU caches and polluting it and, and, waste, and wasting space. So this is what the DSM model is designed to, uh, DSM is designed to overcome. Right, so the idea with DSM is that we're going to take a single attribute for our table and align all the values for all tuples in that table, put them to contiguous together in, 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 a, in a single block. Right, this is sometimes called a sort of vertical partitioning, the same idea. Instead of having things be sort of row-oriented, we're going to store things in a, in a column-oriented manner. And again, this is really great for OLAP workloads when, uh, when you, you're, you don't have to modify the database or the table, where you just want to read things, and you want to read large portions of the data across a, small, a subset of the attributes. Right, contrast this with the, the NSM model, where we assume we were doing point queries to find single operations. So the example would be, like on Amazon, I would use the NSM model to do sort of front-end operations like, uh, you know, go get a single order record for a customer, you know, go update payment information for a single person. For the OLAP model, sorry, the NSM, DSM model for OLAP queries would be like, compute the average sale price of some item for some large segment of, 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 of the calendar year. Right? In that case, I'm not looking at all the different attributes I have for the, for the, the product, I'm just looking at, at just the sale price. So we'll talk more about this. Uh, how to do uh, optimize query execution on the DSM, DSM model later in the semester. But the bottom line is, is you're able to use the vector at a time approach to go grab chunks of data at a time rather than the tuple at a time approach you would do in, in NSM. So the, the column store approach or the DSM approach is not new. Uh, it's actually been around since the 1970s. Um, so the first database system that, that sort of could be ported to claim to be actually a column store was this thing called Cantor that came out of the uh, Swedish Defense Ministry in the 1970s. So this is sort of like an internal project that they were using uh, for, for their data sets. Um, there's only two papers that describe it, and people, pe people typically overlook Cantor as the first column store because when you read the paper, they talk about uh, not in terms of columns or, or databases because it was really early in the 70s, but more in terms of like files. They're doing transformations of files from a row-oriented format to a column-oriented format. But the high-level idea is, is exactly the same as the DSM approach here. Then in the 1980s, uh, there was an academic paper by these guys in Texas 
where they sort of laid out the, 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 the principles, the high-level concepts you'd want to have in the, a DSM database and what, what are the, some of the advantages you, you can get from it. But no one actually really tried to implement the DSM, a DSM database until the 1990s when Sybase came out with this thing called Sybase IQ. So this wasn't like a full-fledged database system, like a, it wasn't a full-fledged column store like we have now. Uh, Sybase sold this as sort of an in-memory query accelerator, in-memory cache for their, their, their regular row store database. So if you had like Sybase I ASE or whatever it's called back then as the primary row store or NSM storage for your database, and then you could use Sybase IQ to sort of stream out updates or stream out values of, 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 of the, of, from the database and store them in the sort of same kind of columnar index as we had in, in, in SQL Server from the last class. So then it wasn't only really, really into the 2000s of when we started seeing sort of these specialized database systems that were pure column storage, or pure DSM uh, storage, storage architectures. So probably the most famous one was uh, Vertica that uh, Mike Stonebreaker and, and other people at Brown and MIT invented. Um, Vectorwise was another famous one out of um, the, the MoneyDB project in, in Europe. There were some other ones, but I, actually they're actually kind of crappy. Uh, like Astrodata, um, Greenplum's still around, um, that's okay. But Vertica, in my opinion, was sort of the, the most state-of-the-art one and really was, was groundbreaking back then. Vectorwise is still around. Uh, so HP bought Vertica, and then in HP's wisdom, they sold Vertica to somebody else. Uh, Vectorwise got bought by Actian, which was the, the rebranding of the original Ingress company, and then they renamed it to, um, they renamed it to Vector. Um, and then, unfortunately, they tried to kill it, um, which sucks. All right, so if you, if you Google Vectorwise, It'll take you to a page that you think is going to be the, the vector page where you can download it, but then just redirects you to the home page, which is kind of terrible because vectorwise is actually really, really good. Um, so, in my opinion, again, from the 2000, Vertica was really the sort of the, the best system. And what was the reason why this was significant and why this this it took you know to the 2000s before all these sort of com stores took off is that prior to this, before the internet started getting really big, you had these large you know these applications that have a lot of users generating a lot of data. Most people didn't really have big databases, right? Maybe so, so few of the Fortune, Fortune 50, Fortune 100 companies, but most people didn't have really, really large data sets. And those that did have really large data sets had a lot of money where they could pay Oracle or Teradata to ship in a, you know, a crate of a machine you know, for, to, to, to do all the, the computations that they wanted to do. You know, Ver, uh, Stoneberger got the idea for building Vertica because he spent some time working at Walmart Labs and saw how, the, how they were struggling with their Terra database, or ter, ter data installation, and they came back to MIT and, and created Vertica. All right, so then now after this, everyone realized that column storage or DSM model was, was, was the right approach. So pretty much everyone today has their own sort of column store add-on or column store database. So Oracle, uh, IBM, and, and Microsoft all sell some kind of column store extension to their database systems. So Oracle has the fracture mirror stuff we'll talk about in a second. Uh, you read about the SQL Server columnar indexes last class, and then IBM has their DB2 Blue Accelerator. And then now there's also sort of these specialized database systems that are, are open source, and, and well, I guess Cloudera is the only one that's open source. But now there's other databases that are, that are re, uh, building off of the ideas that were done in these other guys here. So Cloudera Impala is a um, it's a column store database that runs off top of the HDFS data. And actually, we're going to have the creator of Impala come give a lecture, guest lecture at, at the last class. Um, at the end of the semester, who is also a, a, you know, a st student of Mike Stonebreaker. Amazon Redshift is a rebranded version of Parkcell, and now they're actually rewriting that to be a brand new architecture, um, and that's being uh, headed up by a CMU alum. SAP HANA is this, well, I'll talk a little about it in a second, but it's the thing uh, SAP sells now instead of trying to sell you Oracle. And then MemSQL, we've talked about a bit, is uh, in memory. Uh, in memory hybrid system that can support you know, transactions and analytics in the same box. But they now have a column store extension as well. So the basic idea is here, column stores are now sort of more common than they were maybe 10 years ago. And at any time you want to do analytics, it's clear that you want to use them. All right, so uh, with, cluster, with column stores, you wouldn't necessarily have a clustered index like you would on a B, on a B plus tree, or a B plus tree for the NSM model. What you normally do instead is just pre-sort the data uh, in your columns because this is going to allow you to get better compression. So in the case of Vertica, Vertica doesn't allow you to create any index at all. You specify for these, uh, for these segments of data how you want them to be, to be sorted. They call them projections. And the idea is that if you choose a good sort ordering, 
That'll allow you to get better compression, as we saw before with run-length encoding and other things. Um, and then the downside is that anytime you update it, you have to make sure you, you fix the sort ordering. And they have a way, a way to do that, which I'll talk about in a second. All right, so the last thing we need to care about in a column store in the DSM model is how we actually identify tuples. So there's basically two approaches to do this. The first is that you always have fixed length offsets in every single column so that you know how to jump to a particular position uh, at, any, any, at any column to find a particular tuple. So in this case here, since I know that my, my data for every single tuple is always the same size, if I want the, you know, at offset of that position 2, uh, I know how to multiply the size of each value by, you know, and it, size of each value by my offset that I want to get to to jump to the right location across every single column. Uh, the other approach is you can actually embed the IDs of the, the whatever tuple you're looking at uh, inside the tuple itself, or inside every single value. So if you want to say, I want to get you know, position 2 here, I know how to scan and find position 2 over here. And you have to do this if you have variable length, um, uh, variable length fields, because you can't jump arbit to some arbitrary location and know exactly you're running at the right, run, uh, landing at the right spot. So I would say no one actually, as far as I know, no one actually does this. When you read the papers, you read the literature about column stores, they talk about how you could do this. Uh, but in practice, I think everyone, everyone does this. Right? And the, the downside is when we, when we talk about compression next class, uh, when you have to have fixed length offsets, it, you're not going to get as good a compression rate as you can get if you have variable length offsets. Because you may have to do some padding to make sure that things are, are aligned. Alright, so the advantages of DSM compared to NSM is that we're going to reduce the amount of wasted work we have to do in our system when we process queries because we're only going to have to read the data that we actually need. So if we have four columns in our table, but a query only specifies it needs to access two of them, we only just read those two columns. And we're also going to get better compression as we'll talk about, uh, we talked a little bit about the last class, we'll talk about more on next week, because we, all the values within a column in, in that block of memory are going to be of the same type. Right? And they're all going to be roughly in the same range. And of course the downside is that uh, it's, you don't want to run transactions on a DSM uh, table or DSM storage because any single time you have to do an insert, you have to break up the tuple and to write it to different mem memory locations. Anytime you need to do a, like a select star and get the, all the attributes to put it back uh, in the final output, you have to stitch the different memory locations back together. And right? that's additional mem copy. So, one observation now I want to make is that the, the way people would use you know, a DSM versus NSM is typically based on how long ago the data was actually modified or inserted. So typically what happens is when a, when a tuple is first inserted into the database, it's more likely to be updated again in the future. But then over time as it ages, it's less likely to be updated or used in a transaction. Right? Think of this like you know, how you use websites. Right? If you go to Reddit or Hacker News, I look at the top posts, I go in and I add a, add a comment, maybe I'll go back and, and you know, tweak my comment if it's a spelling mistake, or maybe I'll upvote things, right? You're doing, those are transactions that are updating the database on data that was just recently inserted. You almost rarely ever go back to like two years ago and try to, you know, add a new comment to a post that no one's ever going to read, right? So it's very typical in, 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 in database applications that all the hot data where you can do all your transactions are, is stuff that was you know, recently modified or updated. And then over time it becomes colder. And when it becomes colder, that's when you want to do analytics on it to figure out what, you know, try to extrapolate new knowledge, new information based on the data that you've collected. Right, this is the decision support stuff we talked about last class. So, but we want to be able to do, uh, we want to be able to combine the hot data with the cold data when we do our computations or analytical queries so that we can you know, use the freshest data we have to help us make sure that we're not you know, a couple days behind in our decision making. So I showed this diagram before uh, from last class of the bifurcated environment where we have our OLTP silos and this is where our, our, all our new data and updates are coming in and then we stream the changes we have into our ETL component which then feed into now our data warehouse. And this is not actually a one-way street, right? There's actually another path going back the other way where again you do your decision support processes or analytics here to again learn new information about what your customers are actually doing or what your, what your users are actually doing and then you compute some new um, you can compute new answers that you can then feed into the front end to help them do you know do, make different decisions so the example I always like to give is assuming you're Zynga or whatever the, the hot gaming company is now 
Right, this is where all the new updates are coming in as people play your game. You then load it out into your data warehouse. You do some kind of machine learning or analytics to figure out what kind of things you should do to get people to play, you know, buy more crap. And then based on what you find, you send that to the front end and have them tweak what they actually, how they present the game. Right, so the, 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 there's always this one example of, um, I think it's Candy Crush, right? The, the, you hit the little button thing. So the, what they do is they watch to see how you play the game. And if they give you a hard puzzle and you can't figure it out, you end up putting the game down because you get frustrated, right? So you would see all these updates coming in and you see that this, this person played a game and they stopped playing because it was too hard. And then they compute a model to say that when this person comes back three days later, make sure you give them an easy game because if they get really frustrated the second time, they're like, screw this and they'll never play it again. But you give them an easy game, that gets them to be addicted, right? So there's sort of this feedback loop mechanism where we're going back and forth where we're getting new updates, we're doing analytics, and we're, we're pushing new changes to the front end application to change this behavior. The downside is though, this, this whole pipeline is actually slow, right? In some cases, uh, people don't move the, the, the hot data from, from the OSP side to the OLAP side until the every, end of every day, maybe every hour, right? And depending on what kind of application you're trying to support, that actually may be too slow, right? And again, it's, not, it's also not free to sort of shove the data back to, to the front end. So this is what the hybrid storage model that you read about is trying to solve. And the idea is that we want to have a single logical database instance that's going to use both the DSM and the NSM storage models to support both hot and cold data, meaning hot, you know, transactions on hot data stored in an NSM model, and then OLAP queries stored on both the, uh, the hot data and the cold data, all, all, all within one single database. And I'm pointing out here, I'm saying single logical database and not single physical database because for now, we're just, you know, for the paper you guys read, and in our current system, we only run on, on a single node, but other systems like MemSQL or Splice Machine or, or the other, these other systems, they're distributed. But again, to the application, it looks like a single logical database, but underneath the covers, they may have multiple ones. Again, we're gonna have, store all new data when it first arrives in the system in NSM, because that's fast, for, that's what you need for OTP. And then over time, we'll migrate it to a DSM model when we know that we're never, we're, it's unlikely we're gonna have to go back and update it. And we're going to do this again because we're going to get better compression with DSM than with NSM. So we'll be able to store all this much more history about our application in our database in a compressed format in DSM. So there's a couple of different ways to do this. So the first way is that you maintain separate execution engines inside your database system. Uh, when you have one engine that's optimized for NSM and one, one, one engine that's optimized for DSM. So this is actually probably the most common approach. So this is what SAP HANA does. SAP basically bought a bunch of different database startups. Right? They bought P-Time, they bought T-Rex and MaxDB. So they mashed them all together into this Frankenstein thing and they called it SAP HANA. So when all the transactions would show up, they'd first go into P-Time and over time they would, you, would, you would manually migrate the data to T-Rex. And now you can hook up Sybase IQ to the bottom of it as well. Um, and so again, there's, there's separate engines that are written explicitly to operate on data for each of these two different storage approaches. And then what happens is now you need to have sort of upper level part of the system that knows how to take a query and decide, you know, what part do I run on NSM side, what part do I run on the DSM side, and then combine the results to produce a, a final, final answer. Um, this is what Snappy Data does. Snappy Data takes Gemfire and Spark. Uh, Splice Machine does this. They take HBase and Spark. Right? This is probably the most common approach. You take legacy database systems, write a little middleware layer on top of it, and then sort of combine them together. So again, it looks like a single logical database, but physically it's, it's multiple ones. Another approach is to have a single flexible architecture that is able to support both NSM, DSM directly on, on you know, data directly without having to do uh, any kind of coordination between these two separate engines. And this is, the, this is the approach that we actually use. And this, as far as I know, this is what, this is what MemSQL does as well. So if you have separate engines, and this is essentially what I just said, you're going to run basically separate internal database management systems inside of your single system, and one will operate on NSM, one will operate on DSM. And then you basically have to use two-phase commit if you have a transaction that needs to modify data on the two different engines. You, have a way, you need a way to know that your, your changes are durable on both of these engines. Um, so two ways to now do this is the fractured mirror approach, which you talk, I think we talked about before, and then the delta store approach from, from HANA, um, Snappy Data, and Splice Machine. So with fractured mirrors, the basic idea is that the database system is going to maintain a complete separate copy of the database in memory, but in a DSM layout. So 
when we have the primary storage would be the row store and the, the column store would be the mirror. So when a transaction comes along and we have any new updates, they always hit up the NSM side first and then there's a background process that will migrate it over and insert it into the, the column store. So now we have an OLAP query that comes along, the database system has to figure out you know, can I operate directly on the DSM or do you need to get data from both sides and com combine them together. So this sounds kind of wasteful, right? In the case of, of Oracle, uh, this DSM mirror is actually not durable. It's just a in-memory cache. So if, you, if you kill the system and come back, it has to rebuild this all over again. Um, it's an interesting approach because it's actually, uh, it has the, the minimal amount of impact to the rest of the system, right? So if, in order to go make a major change to have, you have to make a major change to this side of the system to be able to sort, uh, support the column store sides, right? But if you have this thing to be as a sort of ephemeral cache, I don't have to change any of this. So if a customer doesn't need to do OLAP queries and doesn't need the mirror, then I don't have to change any, any of this. And then if they do, you, you know, if they do give Larry L some more money and they do get the, the mirror, then they don't have to change any of their application because this is completely transparent to the upper level parts of the system. Right? It's up to the optimizer and the query planner to figure out you know, what part do I run here, what part do I run there. This is essentially the same thing you saw when the paper you read for the, cl the columnar indexes from SQL Server. Right? They left the NSM side alone and they made you know, in-memory mirrors of the indexes. Now, they couldn't, you know, when, in, in that, that early version of the paper from SQL Server, when you do, added the indexes, that you made this side read-only, but in the later versions, they allowed you to, to modify both. So again, this is what Oracle does. Uh, this is what uh, IBM does. Um, this, is, this, is, this is pretty common. Um, and this actually originally came from a paper written in Wisconsin in 2002. Uh, and er, you know, b everybody basically follows a very similar model. Yes? So why would an OLAP query spawn both the databases since the DSM should have an entire copy of right. so Her question is why would the OLAP query potentially have to span both sides? Because this thing is, is done lazily. So there may be data you just inserted that you want to incorporate in your query and, you have to, and it hasn't been migrated over yet, so you have to go back and do the read over here as well. So that's going to be a very small percentage. Great, it's a small percentage, but it's not, yeah. So like, there's extra bookkeeping that I'm not talking about where you have to know like, what portion of my database on the NSM side has been migrated over to the DSM side. So like, I know I can skip those things if I run the query here. Right, yeah, so, so this, I'm being very hand wavy but there's a whole extra smarts going on there's a whole bunch of intelligence going on to know that like, my query uh, does have to touch data over here, but I don't have to read everything all over again. Let me just read the one, you know, few number of pages that I actually need. Right? Right, and this is part of the reason why in the, in the SQL Server case, you, it made the table read only because they had, at that point, they didn't have the, the functionality to know how to span both of these. You just, when it was read only, you know everything was over, always on the, the in-memory column side, the col columnar indexes. So I just fire my query and execute everything there. All right, so there's an extra bookkeeping going on here. All right, the more common approach is the Delta store. Uh, and the idea here is that all our updates are first going to land in this sort of NSM uh, sort of storage space here. And then over time in the background, we will migrate this to the DSM side, right? And this is different than the, the fractured mirrors because for any given tuple, it's either in the Delta store or in the, uh, or on, on the, the column store side, it's never in both. So I don't need to do any extra bookkeeping to say, all right, I read something here, now I need to run my query over here, make, make sure I don't read the same thing twice. You know if you can read it here, then it's not over there yet. Right, so this is what, um, this is what pretty much everyone does. This is essentially what the, the HANA guys do, is what MemSQL does, is what Vertica does. Essentially when you think about, when I said before, like Splice Machine was HBase plus Spark, it's basically the same thing. Think of this HBase as, as the Delta Store side and Spark as the, the DSM side, right? And again, the, the advantage, the reason why you would do this is because uh, your hot data is usually very small and so you can store this in the row storage format here, which is better for, for transactions. Um, and then as it gets cold, you then you migrate it over to the column store side, right? And you do, and you do your analytics there. Yes? Isn't this just basically the same as ETL though? Yeah. Yeah, so, so his statement is, isn't this, this the same thing as ETL, but now it's, in, it's, in, it's in a single database instance rather than separate, separate instance. Absolutely, yes. But the difference is, how do you actually decide how to move things? 
right? In the ETL case, it was you, you as the application programmer have to put a manual process in to migrate things over. And that's essentially what the, what the first part is, right? The first part is you have to decide what should be in the DSM, what should be in the NSM, and how to move things back and forth. Uh, another approach is to look at the, the logs of how queries access data, and then you can figure out, like, uh, you can specify what data to, to, to move. Um, I think this is essentially what, uh, I think this is what HANA does, right? In HANA, it's, it's, the system will figure out what it should move, but then you as the, the administrator still have to tell it, go ahead and start moving things. The last approach is the online approach, is what MemSQL does and what we do, uh, is where we're going to track the access patterns of, of tuples at runtime, and then we can make a decision about when we have idle cycles and when we know we're running out of space, how to move things back from, from the DSM side, sorry, the NSM side to the DSM side. Right, I think this, this, in the paper you guys read, this, we this is what we talk about doing. Right, so then get in, the, in the final few minutes, we'll talk about what we're doing in Peloton. And so in Peloton, the difference is that of all these different systems is that we have a single execution engine that knows how to operate directly on NSM data and DSM data directly without having to have two separate you know, systems to figure these things out. So this means that we don't need to store two copies of the database and then we don't need to sync multiple database segments or different portions of the database anytime we have a transaction that updates either the NSM side or the DSM side, right? And so with this, we're essentially still doing the same Delta Store approach that I talked about before, uh, but we no longer have to have an engine for the Delta Store and an engine for, for the Column Store, right? Sort of single architecture that can handle everything. So to give you an idea how it works, say we have two queries here. We have a OTB query that's going to do an update and an aggregate query that's going to do uh, a scan across uh, a large segment of the table. So the first thing you see here in the OTB query, I'm accessing all, all, all four columns, but in the uh, analytical query, I'm only accessing B and C. So what would happen is the database system would recognize that here's a bunch of cold data that's not being updated anymore, and here's the portion of the data that is it's hot, where I'm, I'm, it's getting updated a lot. So it would create uh, different uh, layouts for the same table where the hot data will be stored in the NSM format and then the, uh, the cold data will be stored in, the, in, the, in the, the, the column store format. In this case here, it's combining B and C together as to be together, packed together in a single column rather than breaking up everyone, every attribute into individual columns because B and C are accessed together here. And depending on the selectivity of the predicate C, it may make sense to include B and C together because now it's a single, you know, uh, cache miss to go fetch the thing you need and then you, you, you compete your aggregation directly on that. Right? So yes? When you say hot data, you mean uh, the data is updated on, but maybe it's not. Even if it, like, uh, if some data is spread, often is it regarded as hot data? So his question is, um, his question is, I'm defining hot to be data that's updated often, but data could still be hot if it's read often. Depends on how it's being read. Right? If it's like select star and a point query to go grab the single tuple, or sorry, a single tuple with all its attributes, then yeah, that would still be considered hot. Right? Uh, if it's being read in a lot of analytical queries, yeah, you, can put it in, uh, in DSM. you would want to put it in DSM because, again, you're not doing point queries to go grab a single tuple, you're, you're, you're scanning segments. Right? Okay. So, real quickly, the way. Uh, we're going to make this all work. In order to have a single, uh, single execution engine, is that we need, to, we need to have an interaction layer that's going to hide the actual true layout of, of data and tuples in memory from the actual query operators that you know, we use to process data, or to use to execute queries and produce answers. So in this example here, this is the same table I had before, A, B, C, and D. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to divide the table into two sections of, uh, called tile groups, where tile group A is going to have a single tile where everything's stored in the NSM format, and tile group B is going to have three tiles where I have a single attribute stored separately, B and C stored together, and then tile four uh, is just uh, D. And so in addition to this, we're also going to have a tile group header and that's stored as a separate column that's sort of packed in all together. Um, and this is where we're going to store the versioning information you would need for MVCC and, and the other stuff, right? So this sort of implicitly, this is stored along this. So now I'll say a query. Uh, I have the aggregate query that I had before, and I want to generate the, uh, the, you know, the, the relational query plan for this. What's going to happen is instead of doing, you know, sending whole materialized tuples or, or vectors from one 
operator to the next. What I'm instead have is these logical tiles, which are essentially lookup tables or position lists that then map uh, tuples at some position to a memory location or where we have the actual attribute. So now what happens here is, in the case of this first tile group, I have my pointers out to B and C being located here, and I don't care that it was stored in NSM versus DSM. So when I pass up this logical tile up the, the query plan to the, to the aggregate operator, it can just look, do this lookup and go directly to the data that it actually needs without having to do, you know, copy things into either a, a uniform format. Because otherwise what I have to do is if I, if I, I would either have to copy the two segments, the two attributes I need out of uh, this tuple and convert it into the column format or convert it, convert it the other way around in order to have a single code line that can execute both of these. Alright, so when you look at the, start looking at the operator code inside of HDOR, or not HDOR, sorry, inside of Peloton, you'll see these logical tiles and they're essentially being these, these, these position lists being passed around from one operator to the next. So does it mean that uh, it will work better if you if your cluster index of primary key is, for example, time step, uh, and uh, like hot data are closer to each other and cold data are closer to each other? So his question is, would this work better if the primary if 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 you were sorted on the, the primary key, which would be a timestamp? Oh, like uh, some representation of hot and cold. <laughs> Would this work, does this work better when uh, the, when hot data is stored together in memory with other hot data and cold memory, cold data is stored, yeah. So what, ha so what happens is, when we have these tile groups, right, we, we know, we're keeping track of the tile groups, how we know what data is actually stored in here, right? So, we're, since we're using MVCC, any single time we update a tuple, if we update it and it's, it's in this tile group here, it ends up going in the NSM, the NSM uh, tile group, right? And so what happens is all the, the data within a tile group were essentially, you know, had this, the equivalent coldness or hotness factor, right? Because they're sort of all migrated from one layout to the next, right? And, and at any time that you update a tuple and it becomes hot again, it would then move out of that, the cold tile group into the hot tile group. So implicitly, all the hot data is stored together in a tile group, all the cold data is stored together in a tile group. So, I mean, if you, uh, on the other hand, I mean, if you have uh, uh, all the tuples are sorted in a very bad order, and then... Well, I mean, to the same as, if all the tuples are sorted in a very bad order, what's a bad order? Like, cold and then hot, cold and hot, and then very cold. But you, you can't do that, right, because you have to store within the tile group, they all have the same layout. So tile group A, I mean, I'm showing two tuples here, but it could be a thousand tuples. They're all going to be hot because they were all inserted, updated recently, and they're all going to be in the NSM format. Then, as things get cold, the background process then migrates them to the, the DSM layout, and then they're not intermixed with hot and cold. Now, if a cold tuple becomes hot, again, we're MVCC, so we would append the new version up into the hot tile group. Okay? Now, we, we can talk about compaction and other things like, like eventually, you know, if, if tuples get deemed as being cold and then they get updated and they get put back in here, now we're going to have a bunch of tile groups with a bunch of holes in them because we're not going to insert, you know, when the way we do the migration now is we take a tile group and we convert it from one format to the next. But you may, that means when you start taking things out of cold tile groups, you're going to have holes and you're not going to put other tuples back in them. So you may want to compact two tile groups together so to save space. Assuming there's no cluster index. Uh, Assuming there's no cluster, yeah, correct, yes. Right, so what I'm describing would be the append only method from, from MVCC, right? Uh, you, yeah, you would have to do more work with if you had like the, um, if you had in place updates or master records. That, that's a good point. All right, so we don't have much time left, so I'll maybe just skip ahead to, uh, to, yeah, to the demo here or the, the example. So, we're going to demonstrate how using an adaptive layout or hybrid storage layout where you have both rows and columns together in a single system gives you the benefit over a sort of singular architecture. So in this case, what we're going to do, we're going to have a workload where we're going to, we're going to model an application where we have different day and night phases. So during the day, we're, going to, it's, we're doing OTP operations because we're inserting new information. Think of like you're trading on in, a, in a financial company, you're trading in the stock market. So you have all these inserts for all the new trades. And then at night, you switch over to do risk analysis. 
So now you start doing analytical, analytical queries that scan a lot of data. So we're going to compare, and it's all inside of Peloton, we're going to compare this workload running on a pure row layout system or NSM system, pure column store, and then our adaptive hybrid layout. So with the row store, what you see is that the scan queries obviously take more time because you're, you're reading a lot of data. And then, then you, when you switch over to do, do the inserts, uh, they, you, you get much faster. But you see this sort of stepping function where the, the scans are getting slower and slower as you go across in time because the database is getting bigger and you're scanning more data. And we compare this with the column store. The column store would be faster for scans but slower for inserts because, again, you have to take your single tuple and do multiple writes to, to different column locations in memory. So now when we compare it with, the, with our hybrid layout, what you see is that when we first start off, we're just as fast as the, uh, as the row store layout because when we first loaded the database, since we don't know anything about the workload, everything defaults to the NSM layout. But then over time, as we start doing analytical queries, we recognize that we should be migrating the data to be a, to be a column store. So that's why you see this little tick, this sort of downward trend as we get faster and faster as we start moving the data to be in, in a column-oriented format. Then when we switch over to do inserts, we're just as fast as the row store because we're just, we're just inserting to the regular row store. Right? It's overlapping here, but you can see that the, the, the red line overlaps with the, 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 the row store line. And then we switch back to now to do the, to the scans, and there's a little uptick where we, we have to migrate the data we just inserted as a row store part now to be the column store. But over time, we're doing less and less compared to the amount of data we have to read. So we end up getting uh, better performance than, than, the, uh, than, certainly than the row store, but also the column store here. So this is showing you that within a single execution engine, we get the benefits of a row store and a column store without having the user do anything special. Because right? we can migrate the data from one layout to the next uh, transparently. And we can adapt it to based on what, how the, the queries are actually using the data. Okay? Yes? Faster than the column store. This question is why is it even faster than the column store? Because in the pure column store, everything's stored exactly as separate columns. In this case, here is the example I showed before where the two columns we packed together in a single cache line. Again, that only works if the selectivity is, is very high. And, and I think in this example it is. Okay, so um, there's another paper on, uh, that. that uh, that's optional called the single H2O and this is a precursor to what we were doing here. The bottom line is what they would always do is in, they could not support hybrid layouts, they could not support hybrid layouts to do both transactions and analytics. Actually, I shouldn't even show this because they, they can't even do updates. Um, basically what happened is they were sort of doing like fractured mirrors on the fly. Um, you would have the original data and then you would look at what the query you're executing wants to do and then as you scan the, the, the data you would transform it to the layout that's more optimal for, for, for that particular query. So if you came back again and executed the same query, maybe with different parameters, the data would already be laid out for you in the, in the format that you want. Right? In my opinion, this is wasteful because you're doing, you're doing this transformation on the fly as you execute the query. And they can't support updates. Right? This, is, this is a read-only approach. So this, is, this came out maybe a year or two before our paper uh, from the guys at, at, at Harvard and um, Monet DB. All right, so uh, to finish up, so it's my opinion that the flexible architecture that I showed you here is the, is the better approach. Um, the hybrid architectures is certainly with the, the, where everyone's going, the major trend in database systems today, right? Uh, you see all these HAP systems that talk about having to support analytics and transactions all in a single logical database, right? And this is, they're essentially doing this thing, what I'm describing here. They have both the row store and the column store all represented together in, in, a, in a uniform um, in a uniform location or presented to the user as a single database. So it's my opinion that if you have the hybrid layout, this is going to allow a relational database system to support all possible known data work, database workloads that we know about. So document stores, row, sto or row stores, column stores, key value stores, graph stores, all of these things can be represented in a, in a, in a relational database system and get really good performance. Uh, just as good as the sort of specialized systems. The only thing that we're not going to be able to support is machine learning workloads because that's doing linear algebra on matrices and it's difficult to represent matrices in, 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 a, in a relational model. So again, with that, with the exception of machine learning, we, we can do everything you'd want to do in a database in, in a hybrid store. Okay? Alright, so uh, next class we're going to talk about compression.